السنة انتظرة يمتى يجي شهرك حق أمك الزهرة شاغلني بالسمرة غيرك فلا أهتم كل فكري بمحرم انت نهجر دياري وحيا بوصاب مهتم عفيت أرض وسماء وجيت بهالرجاء أخذني للعزاء وخلي خيادي أنا أدري ما تبه أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لله ما في السماء وانت وما في الارض وَإِن تُبْدُوا مَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَوْ تُخْفُوهُ يُحَاسِبُكُمْ بِهِ اللَّهِ فَيَغْفِرُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيُعَذِّبُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه من ربي والمؤمنون كل آمن بالله وما لا إكنتي وكتبي ورسولي لا نفرق بين أحد من رسولي وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا غفرانك ربنا غفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعا لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت
ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا أنت مولانا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين صدق الله العلي العظيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بسير بالعباد ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل ونعم المولى ونعم النصير والصلاة والسلام والتحيط والإكرام على الرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد المحمود الأحمد الذي سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي العرض بأبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المحسومين المظلومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله أنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا ومصل على محمد وقل رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الدين عند الله الإسلام my respected elders, brothers and sisters in Iman across the globe. Salamu alaikum jamian wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Question. Why do we need religion in the 21st century? We've discussed a substantial amount in the previous nights and we are coming and have now come and arrived at our culmination of our conversation on the quest for meaning, finding purpose in our life and learning from the example of the Husseini movement and the movement of Abu Abdullah al-Husseini on the plains of Karbala and how that that movement is not disconnected from the movement of any of the other Ahlul Bayt or the other infallibles. In this understanding, we should keep in mind that as individuals on this planet, what is our worldview? And in that, we must actually build on that. The quest for recognizing that begins here. It does not end here. In understanding this concept, where do my thoughts come? Where do my beliefs come from? Where does my narrative come from? Where does how I look at the world actually come from? Does it come from me? Does it come from my own thoughts, my own ideas, my own convictions? Or were these perhaps imposed on me, either by means of force or by their, either by means of just happening without re recognizing it. Towards this end and to this end, in culminating this conversation and concluding this conversation, I want to reflect on this idea of what is the view and what is the worldview and the perspective of the prophets? What is the worldview of the imams? What is the worldview that God espoused for us to adhere to? Where do we find ourselves in that picture? In understanding this concept and drawing to a commencement of our conversation, I want to look at what is the concept of drift and how does it affect us in our daily lives? I want to look at the necessity of religion. Do we need religion in our modern life? And if so, why? This very, very critical question that many people have asked young and old in the modern world and not getting a good answer to this question has led many people to forsake religion, either explicitly or implicitly. 
And I want to look at with respect to this issue of how we live in the modern world. What is our relationship to the f- history that it comes before us, that has come before us, and where we are going? How can we learn about where we're going based on the history that has passed before us? Not only in our community, but in other faith-based communities. And finally, I want to look at what was the worldview of the prophets? What was the worldview of the imams? What is the worldview of the scholars? And ultimately, what is the worldview of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam on the plains of Karbala? This will give a commencement to our conversation and our discussion that we have been having in the previous nights so that we can have a better sense of meaning, purpose, and living a God-centric life. Wherever you may be, across the globe, in the east or the west, from the bottom of your heart, send a salawat on Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We have been discussing this concept of the world view. And we said, much like the blind men and the elephants, the blind men, one who is touching the side of the elephant, the trunk of the elephant, the tusk of the elephant, each one is touching a different part of this creature in front of them. But no one is putting the pieces together and realizing that this is another creature. It is an elephant. And this is much like the modern world we're living in. We're looking at society from one vantage point, from the vantage point of material progress, from the vantage point of evolution, from the vantage point of Darwinian or Darwinism, the vantage point of scientism, the vantage system of so many isms that in 2015, the word of the year, according to some dictionary publications, was the word isms. We live in a world of isms where we have socialism and communism and all of the very likes of progress and evolution and Darwinisms and the likes. And all of these elements influence our way and shape how we see the world, whether we realize it or not. But where is God-centricism within this entire scheme of reality and what we perceive to be reality? I want to tell you about a drift. What's a drift? Have you ever been to a body of water? Have you ever stopped and have you ever gone towards a lake? Have you ever gone towards a stream, a river? Have you ever gone towards the beach where the sea meets the land, where the shore is there between the two that unites them? Have you ever seen the ocean? Well, if you were to go to the ocean, and many of you have gone, you would have seen something. That if you stand in the body of water and you have no reference point, so if you're in a lake, for example, or if you're in some body of water, you may not realize it in a moment, but maybe after 30 minutes, maybe after one hour, maybe after some period of time, if you did not know where the shore was, imagine a blank shore, imagine there's no trees, imagine there's no, you don't have anything there that's on the land to look at as a reference point that you can see that I've moved this this far away from where I started. You will find that after hours, you may be very far away from where you started in the body of water. Imagine you're right in the center of the sea. You're not by the coast. There's no water nearby. Hours pass. You're floating on the surface. Do you think you're still in the same location you started at? Whether you realize it or not, in the lake or in the sea, you will find that you have moved away. Whether you realize it or not, you will be in a place You are not where you started. That water, that body water has a drift. That drift takes you away from where you started, whether you realize it or not. It may take you closer to your destination. It may take you farther from your destination. Or maybe you don't even have a destination of where you're trying to get to. It will move you away. In that case, you may have gotten closer to anywhere. The question that I ask you and I ask myself is where do we lie in the grand scheme of things? Where are we in this? Is it possible that we have drifted away from our center? We have drifted away that one concept, one idea, one movement that has been implanted in our minds, whether we realize it or not, has caused us to drift away from a God-centric life. It may have caused us to drift away from the lives of the prophets and what they adhere to. It may have caused us to drift away. Why do I say this? If you look at the lives of the prophets and the initiatives that they took and the stands that they took and you reconcile them with modernity, you may find that what they did made no sense. It may have been counterintuitive. Starting from the very beginning, let's look at the life of Nabi Adam alayhi salam. 
If you look at the life of Nabi Adam, how many people were there at that time? You may say, what's the point in such a small world? God could have asked the question, what's the point of creating a universe and, and inhabiting the earth with just a few people? You know, and now especially looking at the size of our galaxy and the universe and the galaxies within galaxies, one after the other, why go through this effort? If it was about numbers, for example, in our modern world, when you put on an event, when we put on an event in our communities, what do we look at? Do we look at numbers? Do we say that this is based on truth and principle? Or do we say how many people will attend? Do we say, will we say, for example, is this popular? Is this going to be a popular narrative? Is this going to be popular amongst the people? Is this going to be something that will get a large volume of attendees in? And that may not be wrong in and of itself. However, it should perhaps be based on truth, no? On a correct narrative, no? What's the priority when you look at your arrangements? What was the priority of the prophets? Let's go further. Nabi Nuh alayhi salam. How many years did he preach? We're told thousand years he preaches or 950 years. And if you add his length of span of life, roughly 1100 years, 1200 years of that almost 1000 years of preaching. And how many followers did he have to show for it? But a handful? Let's go further. Ibrahim alayhi salam. In a moment in the middle of a barren desert where there are no witnesses, he goes and he makes the ultimate sacrifice. He has this son. He has this wife. He leaves them for the sake of God, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Was he trying to do this for pomp, for glory, for fame, for fortune, so people knew his name, so he would become world-renowned? Who was there witnessing this? Who was there to enshrine this? It was enshrined by God in His holy text, in His holy book, in the Qur'an al-Majid wa al-Furqan al-Hamid. That there was nobody to witness this event. Yet it was such a magnanimous event that history documented it for time and memorial, forever. There were no witnesses. He did it for sincerity. Would I do that? Would modernity suggest me to do that? By the way, modernity, as we've been highlighting, has beautiful elements, has spectacular elements. But, again, it's one part of the elephant. It's not the entire beast. Let's go further. Musa alayhi salam and his stand. He gets cornered at a moment. And he's cornered by the army of Pharaoh right before what's called the Red Sea. The sea parts for him. He had absolute certainty. Well, or did he? You may ask. That God would deliver and God did deliver. What was his viewpoint of the world? How does that reconcile with our viewpoint of the world? You go further, the Holy Prophet of Islam himself, Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, where one famous companion comes forward and says, I have never questioned Muhammad's prophethood like I have today. What was the metric that Rasulullah was looking at? And what was the metric this individual and others like him were looking at? Was it a game of numbers? Was it a game of popularity? Was it a game of fortune? Was it even a game? These things matter. This is a world view. Thirteen years in Mecca, Rasulullah spent. What happened there? Ten years in Medina. Thirteen years he's dealing with the difficulties. And they've done the most difficult things on Rasulullah. Thirteen years pass. He goes to Medina in the migration. The Muslim army develops and develops and develops in strength over the years. Until a moment happens where they go for what's called Fatha Mecca or the conquest of Mecca. Rasulullah is in the peak and the height of his strength. And he could squash the enemy on the other side in the easiest way if he wanted to. Yet what did he do? He forgave them. He gave, he gave them amnesty. Why? Was this about power? Was this about spreading Islam through the sword by might? What was Rasulullah looking at? What was the Holy Prophet looking at? And what, the, what were the prophets before the Holy Prophet looking at? 
And what are we looking at? You see this realm of material worldview, material progress. It's given us many benefits in terms of medicine, in terms of engineering, in terms of science, in terms of many things. But it's still not able to give us one thing. And that's peace of mind. Study after study has shown that as progress takes place, as economic development takes place, in fact, I was reading a publication from economists from Europe who found a connection correlation and argued and they suggested that there is such a strong link, there is such a strong connection between economic development and progress and unhappiness that if you see unhappiness in a society increasing and you don't know anything about progress and development, you can infer you can infer based on the rise in unhappiness that progress and economic development is occurring before even seeing any data on it. What does that tell you? That the correlation between economic development and prosperity and progress is directly correlated to unhappiness in life. Does that mean that these places that are not developed, that are not progressing, are by virtue automatically happy? No, no, not necessarily at all. You know, there's many blessings of progress, you know. In our society, many of us, many of you and the countries that you're living where you're viewing this from, you have economic security, you have healthcare security, you have so many benefits and so many luxuries that other people in the world may not have in places in the Middle East, in Asia and other parts of the world, in Africa. They don't have these luxuries that you and I have and enjoy. We're not saying that. We're saying, why is it that as progress has occurred, as economic development has occurred, at the same token, at the same level, we are not happier. Rather, we are more dissatisfied. We are more unhappy. And all the data is suggesting exactly that. Why? Because we've looked at one side of the equation. But we haven't looked at the other. We haven't looked at the tranquility side, the peace side. One person who's commented and spoken on this extensively, and he wrote this not today, some years ago, several years ago, in fact, 100 years plus. The book was written in 1897, roughly 123 years ago. The author, Emile Durkheim. The title, Le Suicide, a book written in French by a French sociologist and philosopher, Emile Durkheim, a man educated at the Sorbonne in France. This individual identified an alarming trend that was happening in Europe at the turn of the Industrial Revolution. What did he realize and how true that was then and how true is it today? What did he realize? He was looking at the economies of Europe, particularly the likes of Italy and England and the likes of Holland, the Netherlands. In this equation, at that time, Europe was moving from an environment that was very agricultural, and moving towards an environment that was more industrial in nature. And in this movement from agricultural to industrial economies, there was something that was changing in terms of how people operated in the world. What was changing? Italy at the time was the most agricultural, agrarian at the time. And more developed and more industrial was England. And even more developed and even more industrial at that time was Holland, the Dutch, the Netherlands. That was the most developed country in the region at that time. You will remember the Dutch West India Company and the Dutch East India Company. These were, in fact, at times known as just the company. They had become nations as their own. That's how powerful they were. Nonetheless, there was Italy, England, and then the Netherlands and Holland. And there's this dynamic that they were changing and shifting. What did Emil Durkheim notice? Emil Durkheim noticed and please bear this in mind and understand how our world is developing and how it has been shaped by a worldview that is impacting us whether we realize it or not. He realized that as industrialization increases between Italy, between England, between Holland and the other nations of Europe, as industrialization increases, Durkheim noticed that industrialization increases, so too does suicide. As industrialization increases, suicide in a society increases. Why? 
Why is this an issue? This is an issue because one taking their life, an individual taking their life is a tip of the iceberg problem. That is that when one person takes their life, there are hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe tens of thousands, maybe more people who are below the surface suffering. You know the iceberg? You know the one that sank the Titanic? They saw just the tip of that iceberg. When they saw the tip of that iceberg, as you know, at that moment in time, when they saw that, they were able to steer away from that. But below the surface was the majority of the ice, which struck the Titanic and caused it to decline. You know, even the Titanic, some of us think that's someone else's problem. This is a humanitarian problem, but they were also followers of the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam. Any who are on the Titanic, any loss of innocent life, Muslim, non-Muslim, doesn't matter, is something that should hurt me and does hurt me. And every day people are being lost to suicide and mental health related issues that are not being talked about because our society is impacting us and we don't even realize it. Durkheim identified that there are many people who are suffering because of what our modern progressive world is doing to our minds. And it doesn't matter if you're in the East or the West. It's the concept of progress and the fundamental philosophy on which our society is built. What were the reasons Durkheim said that this happens? He listed a few in particular. He said, number one, there were certain shifts that were happening from an agricultural agrarian society to a modern industrial society. These shifts were causing people to become very unwell in their heads, mentally unwell. What was number one? He said society was shifting from com communal to, in to individual. Why did this matter? Communal to individual. In societies such as China and other environments, the narrative was that you did what was in the best interest of the community, of the society at large. Whereas in a place like, for example, in an industrial economy, an individualism was taken hold. Meaning, you do what is in the best interest of you as an individual. It does not matter what impact that has on your family or your community. As an individual, you optimize yourself. There are beautiful aspects of this. For example, the beautiful aspects of this are that when you go to a gathering many times in an individualistic society, if you say you have certain dietary restrictions, they will accommodate that. You, we will accommodate in an industrial individual society that you want to eat this, it will be taken care of because your individual sanctity is important. Whereas in a communal society, this is what we have. You want to eat it, eat it. Don't, no. But there's also negative consequences, which we'll come to, about individualism that we may not realize with respect to that. Such as what? Durkheim identified at that time that we live in a society, in a world, that when you achieve success, if you become the Warren Buffett, the Jeff Bezos, the Bill Gates, the people of all of the material wealth of society, you get all of the glory, society says you achieved what you achieved because of good luck, because of not good luck, rather because of your hard work and your effort and all of those elements. However, there's a very important element of luck in the equation that goes uncalculated. Why? Because many times those individuals who have achieved great success in their life, although they did work hard and no one is to deny that and no one is to diminish that, at the same time, there is an element of luck. For example, Jeff Bezos himself says, the richest man on the planet at the time of this recording, he says that I won a series of lotteries. What does that mean? That he didn't work hard, that he didn't put effort? No, it means that even despite putting in effort, there's for every Jeff Bezos, for every Bill Gates, for every Warren Buffett, for every Steve Jobs, there are a thousand who are not. If you look at the history of Silicon Valley, you will find thousands and thousands of companies that people know, that do not know their names. There are companies who had the exact same concept, the exact same idea as another company, yet they just came a few months or a few years earlier than the market was ripe. Uber, before Uber, there was the likes of Taxi Magic. Same concept, same idea a year or two before, did not work. Was that person, were those, was that team not dedicated? Was that team not hardworking? Was that team not right? Timing, that's the element of luck. So individual societies were much less happier because a few people made it. And a few people, many people, majority of people didn't make it. And so when you made it, society said you made it because you put in all the effort and all the work and you were put on a pedestal and you get a medal and an award. But if you didn't, society puts you in a much crueler place. Society says you didn't make it because you didn't try. 
You didn't make it because you didn't put in the effort. And that very well may not be true at all. Number one, the first reason why Durkheim said unhappiness is increasing. The second reason as to why Durkheim said is excessive hope, too much hope. Excessive hope, too much hope? What? Yes, it's possible that hope is a beautiful thing. Hope is a good thing, but too much hope can ruin your life. How? How? There's a phenomenon called the Paris Syndrome. Or this idea that exists in certain Japanese tourists. What is this phenomenon? This phenomenon says, and I, has I been identified as this notion that many tourists or select amount of tourists from Japan have this wish, have this desire to visit Paris, France. When they wanted to visit Paris, France, they have this dream of going to the Eiffel Tower. And when they go to the Eiffel Tower and they see it, they imagine that this will be the most magnanimous, momentous moment in their life. And so they book a flight, perhaps from Tokyo or some other part of Japan, Okinawa. They land in Paris. They take a journey and they go and they see the Eiffel Tower. They see France and they become depressed. And they have physical symptoms of depression. Not just a thought of, of this, you know, mental health should be taken very seriously. There's an element of chemical imbalance that exists. No one's denying that. What we're talking about here is cetris paribus. That is this idea that all other factors being equal, how is it that one economy experiences more elements of mental well un unrest and lack of well-being than others? So they can actually have physical symptoms. That is the concept of excessive hope. Hope within reason is good, but having abnormal hope, it leads to depression or it leads to disappointment. And that's what you want to be cognizant of. The second element, excessive hope. Hope is very important. Hope is very critical in one's life, but that should also be done in moderation and also be kept in moderation. What else is it that is leading people to become very unhappy and unrestful in, in this modern world? Too much freedom. You may say, if too much freedom? Do I want to live in a totalitarian regime? Do I want to live in a place where I can't even have a majlis of Imam al-Hussein? Do I want to live in a place where I'm constantly under fear of lockdown and all of these other elements? No, 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 no. We're talking about something else here. Dr. Barry Schwartz, a psychologist, identified that when we are given too much choice, we begin to second guess ourselves and we begin to think that things are better had we chosen something else. He asked in a group of individuals, two groups, one group to go to the grocery store and pick out of these four different products. And he sent another group and he said, pick out of these 20 different products. And then he asked them, how happy are you with your choice? He asked group A and group B. Group A said that we are very happy with our choice. Group B said, if we had more time, we would have chosen some other product. He goes on to explain that when we are given too many choices and we finally pick something, we come to the conclusion of regret. We regret not choosing the right thing. This is not just about grocery store products, by the way. This is part of the narrative that is sold to us about finding the ideal spouse. That in a world that says that your ideal spouse that is pushed by certain companies and entertainment industries, your ideal spouse is somewhere out there and you have to go find them. They may be in Australia or in England or in Ireland or in Scotland or in Asia or they may be across the globe and you have to find that person. That's one example of this paradox of choice. That is this too much freedom leading to us being very unhappy in our lives. What is the fourth element? He says the declining nature of the importance of family. The declining of the family structure, Durkheim argued. What did he mean by this? There's a community, not too far away from a community that I resided in actually in the United States. That community is called Rosetto, Rosetto, Pennsylvania. And it is named after a town in Italy. You know, Italy, if you read the history of it, Sicil Sicily in particular, if you read the history of it, many of the people who are descendants of Sicily are actually of Arab descent because the Arabs used to live there and had, had been part and parcel, it had been part of civilization, of the Islamic civilization. Not too far away from Sicily is Rosetto. Rosetto, Pennsylvania is named after Rosetto, Italy. In the 1800s and into the 1900s, communities from this part of Italy migrated to a particular town in Pennsylvania. Now, this phenomenon known as the Rosetto effect is known in cardiology as well as sociology. What is the phenomenon? 
A group of cardiologists, when they were looking at this town, they found that Rosetto, Pennsylvania, it had a much lower rate of cardiovascular disease, heart disease, than the towns that were nearby, next door. And when they realized that they had a lower rate, they said, what is causing them to have a lower rate of heart disease? Meaning they were healthier. What was causing it? They said they must eat healthy. They must not smoke. They must eat very healthy food. When the doctors looked at their diet, when they looked at how they lived, they found that they smoked cigars regularly and they ate lard, heavy fats, animal fats. This is not a suggestion to do that. But the researcher said there's something here that we're missing. So they went into the town. When they went into the town, they saw that this society, this community that was there was like no other in the surrounding neighborhoods and towns. What was it like? They said that every day, the community, the family would get together, come together, and in the backyards, they would all gather together. They would all cook in a large pot, in a large vessel. They would talk, they would joke, they would spend time together. And then they would put the meal on the table and they would eat together. And they would spend time together. I remember I met a brother not too far away in a community that's very close by to Rosetto. And this brother was telling me in Allentown, Pennsylvania, he told me that we used to go and play soccer, football for those in Europe. We used to go play in in the 70s. We used to go play in Rosetto. And it was as if we had gone to Europe to play. The stands were filled. The family was there. There was jubilance. It was a different environment completely. And that's what the cardiologists found as well. They concluded that the environment, the social dynamics, the family structure of the community of Rosetto, Pennsylvania, was actually having a positive impact on the health of the city dwellers, of the dwellers of the town. Family has an impact in this world and indeed in the hereafter as well from our framework. And the final element, the fifth element of the equation, which Durkheim says was leading to people becoming very unhappy, was the decline of religion. Durkheim himself was at least an agnostic, if not an atheist. But he said, we need religion now more than ever. We need religion now more than any time in history. Because of the structure it gives, because of the community it gives, because of the sense of meaning and purpose it gives one's life. From our perspective, it's clear. The benefits of religion in this dunya and in the hereafter, most importantly. But I'm saying that the, the world view that may not even be God-centric acknowledges the benefit of the concept of community based on religion and faith and sense of meaning and belonging and purpose. I ask you, what is your sense of meaning? What's your sense of belonging? Where do you lie in the spectrum? I want that community members, those watching, not only benefit from the aspects and the vantage point of having a harmonious life, but understand how does that drift that we talked about earlier, how does that drift impact your life, whether you realize it or not? You may have been drifting towards getting just income and wealth and building the next house and all of that's well and good. However, do not do that devoid and in the absence of God. Do not do that devoid and in the absence of the prophets. Do not do that devoid and in the absence of the imams and the infallibles. Your compass, your guide to tawheed ultimately. Having said that, as we draw to a close, I want to share with you some experiences that history repeats itself. As Imam Amir al-Mumin tells his son to study the pages of history, I studied them as if it was, I was as if I was walking amongst the ruins of past civilizations. What does history say, and what can we learn from other faith-based societies and communities that came before us? What can we learn, and how can that connect us to the message of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam? What happens? The Dutch West India Company, which I explained to you and I mentioned a few moments ago, they had a certain member, a few members of their community from the Jewish community who are in Brazil. They wanted to relocate them to, this is history, clear history, they wanted to relocate them to New Amsterdam, which we now call New York. And in this movement, they wanted that they relocate roughly 20, 25 people from that region to New Amsterdam. They wrote a letter to the governor of New York or New Amsterdam at the time and they said to Peter Stuyvesant, we want to relocate these individuals, do we have your permission? He wrote back a response saying, I cannot allow for this. Why? Because if they come, who will take care of them? Who will pay for this? I don't have the budget, who will take care of them? They wrote back a one-line response, you have nothing to worry about, they will be taken care of by their own. Now, this first wave of immigrants in the 1600s, roughly 400 years ago, that came to New Amsterdam, 
100 years on, this group did not come with their top scholars. They did not come with their top writers. They did not come with their top intellectuals of their faith. 100 years later, sociologists said there was not a single person who identified with the Jewish faith in the tri-state region of the United States. The next wave of Jewish immigrants who came to the United States of America came in the 1800s, roughly 200 years after their predecessors. They came adamant with this notion of bringing their top intellectuals, their top writers, their top rabbis, their top... All of the people who are the top thinkers from the faith-based perspective, they all came from Europe. They were all brought from Europe. And despite this, sociologists say, the first generation of those individuals who migrated were Orthodox, the first generation of the second wave, the 1800s. The first generation were Orthodox, the second generation were conservative, that means religious, but less than the other ones. The third generation were reform, and the fourth generation were de-Judaized. They were no longer Jewish on the basis of faith. Why do I say this? There was a very interesting saying in the second generation of the community that came in 1800s. They said that in their analysis, they found that they had built huge synagogues. And in building these huge synagogues, they had a saying after they had built all of these massive palace-like structures. They said these are heavy on sweat and light on tears. One should, as the Ahlul Bayt tell us, one should gain wisdom from wherever they can find it and learn from the lessons of civilizations. These synagogues are heavy on sweat, light on tears. What does it mean? We spent so much money. We spent so much time. We spent so much effort in building them and importing all of these different types of infrastructure from across the globe to make the most beautiful palace-like centers of worship. And there's no one here weeping on the Sabbath. There's no one here endeavoring in the religion. The question I ask is, is it possible that our communities are doing the exact same thing? Building these massive infrastructure, these beautiful centers, and these magnanimous palace-like infrastructure of both modern and historical significance, and having the best calligraphy, and having the best design, and the best of everything. And yet they're empty? Or they may be empty in the future. Alongside physical infrastructure, it's very important to have spiritual infrastructure. The infrastructure of the heart, the infrastructure of the mind, the educational development. Never neglect the educational element. They must go hand in hand. Do not think that just if I build it, they will come. No, no, no. You must build the houses in the heart, the houses of spirituality. I ask this because the final question I ask you, keeping drift in mind, keeping where we have weathered towards, where we have moved from, have we moved from our center, from God? Look at the movements of the Imams. Imam Amir al muminin he writes letter after letter that you will find in Najwa al to who? Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. How? Why? What? Does Ali ibn Abi Talib not know that Muawiyah will not act on his advice? What was the worldview of Ali ibn Abi Talib? Now, granted, these are imams, no doubt. But how do we measure our world? How did the imam measure the world? Go further, Imam Hassan al Mustaba. Why is he doing a priest treaty with Muawiyah? Does he not know that Muawiyah will trample over what he's, do, what he's signing? What lens are we looking at? How are we assessing? What the Imams did. Imam Sajjad, he is reviving the memory of his father and weeping and doing the majalis and encouraging the majalis and he's writing the du'as of Sahifa Sajjadiya. I thought he's supposed to fight for his right and rule, no? What about Imam Baqir, Imam As-Sadiq alayhi salam? They are using the forum and the platform of educating the people and using education to spread the message of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. No, I thought they were supposed to be fighting and taking their right and ruling over the people. What about Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam? He is spending his life away in the dungeons, in prison, unjustly. What about Imam Al-Radha? He is the heir apparent of the ruler, as we are seeing. I thought he's supposed to establish rule. What's going on? What about Imam Sahib Al-Zaman? Remember, the message, the mission, the stand of Sayyid al-Shuhada Aba Abdullah is not disconnected 
from any of the other Imams. The Imams, based on the time and space, they all would have done the same thing. Look at what Imam al Hussein alayhi salam's movement was. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he forgives Hur bin Yazid al Riyahi, the person who is responsible for his children ending up in Karbala, his women ending up in Karbala. He forgives him. He had no ego. If we look at it from the world lens, Imam Sayyid al Shuhada, he has people like Habib and Muslim ibn Ausaja, elderly men fighting with him who have to tie their back in order to fight. Imam has 72 companions on the battlefield, on the plains of Karbala. 72. I thought it was about numbers. I thought it was about getting as many people as possible. Imam al Hussein is looking at the world from a different lens, a different world view. It may not be about numbers. What about John? What He was a servant. He was a slave in Arabian society in the eyes of the other party. What benefits? What did he have? What experience did he have? What about the teenagers who sacrificed their life in Karbala? When you look and you try to see the world from the lens of Imam al Hussein, who's giving water to Hor and his forces, who's praying for even the enemy at times, we realize that the worldview of the Imams, the worldview of the Prophets, is very different than our own. Why? Because their worldview is God's plan. Their worldview is Tawheed. It's not about ego. It's not about me. It's about He, God Almighty. How else can a six-month-old have value on the battlefield? And what tremendous value did this six-month-old have? We are told the night before Ashura, the night that led up to Ashura, Zainab, is having a conversation with her brother, Sayyidah Zainab Salam Allahi Alaiha. That my brother, have you checked your companions? Have you tested your companions? Aba Abdullah, he knows. Aba Abdullah, he says, Zainab, worry not. Aba Abdullah, in another moment in the night before Ashura, he gathers his companions. He says, Oh companions, you are to leave. You are free to leave. You can take the dark and leave, and no one is there to blame you. I lift my allegiance. I lift my bay'ah from you. Go, your life is safe. And on top of that, I take the guarantee that I will grant you paradise through my shafa'ah on the day of judgment. What other deal would you want? You get the best of this world and the best of the hereafter. What other deal do you want? I give you amnesty. I give you sanctuary. Leave in the middle of the night. There's no one to blame you. Habib speaks on behalf of everyone, it is as if they say. He says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I would not leave, we would not leave you. If they tear us to pieces a thousand times, we will give our life. Imam Ali Musalam, he gives that magnanimous statement. He said, neither my father and neither my grandfather, Rasulullah, neither Ali al Murtaza, neither Rasulullah Adam, neither of them had companions like I had. Allahu Akbar. This was the extent of the companions. Of Sayyid al Shuhada. We are told that when the day breaks, Sayyid al Shuhada, companion after companion goes, companion after companion goes, and finally, family member after family member goes, up until the point that there is only one individual left, who one would not even think was part of the list of the marchers, a six month old by the name of Abdullah al Radi, or Ali al Asghar, as he is known by some. This six-month-old, his mother's milk had gone dry. And Imam al Hussein alayhi salam takes him towards the enemy. And he begins to speak to the enemy. And he says, O oh army, you may find that I am guilty in your eyes. You may find that I am guilty. But what has this child done? What has this child done to deserve this thirst? His mother's milk has gone dry. If you have enmity towards me, at least give some water to this child because he has no milk. 
that we are told at this time when Imam al Hussein says this, we are told that the enemy on the other side, there was a debate that emerged. Some of the enemy were saying, give the child water. What has the child done wrong? The other said, no, break the heart of Hussein, make him suffer. Uh, Umar ibn Sa'ad saw this uh, and he said to Hormala, who was the archer, he said, Hormala, cut off the words of Hussein. He was seeing that the enemy, so the enemy's army was turning against him. He says, end the debate, finish off Hussein. They say this wretched man, uh, Hormala, he lifts, uh, some say a three-pronged arrow. He says, they lift, he lifts an arrow or a spear. He takes aim uh, towards uh, Aba Abdullah, who in his hands, he has a six-month-old. Uh, he lets go of the arrow. The arrow goes through the wind as if piercing time, as if stopping time. And it goes towards the Aba Abdullah. But who does it strike? A six-month-old child, Abdullah Radhi. We are told the child begins to flap his hands like a bird flaps its wings in the hands of Imam al Hussein. Allah, the heart of Aba Abdullah, the love for Allah in the personality of Aba Abdullah. He has this child, but maybe the sabr of Aba Abdullah. But what about the heart of the mother? How does the Sayyid Shuhada tell a mother that her six month old has been slaughtered? Allah knows how. Oh, Abu Abdullah got there. We are told when he shows the mother, the child, the questions that would emerge in the heart of a mother, who knows? But one thing is for sure, they do not even slaughter the animals that young. Oh, Abu Abdullah, how a six month old. I ask one final question. Oh, Allah, how does as a father without any assistance and aid, how does Abba Abdullah bury a six month old child? Oh, night lengthen your hours. Oh, night in your soul Oh night lengthen your hours Oh night hold in your souls Tomorrow you the heads upon space I call out to you, O night of my farewell Your wind brings to me a scent, a smell Never did I hope for it, but you befell. I am Zainab, and from the scent I tell. Oh, night, I smell my brother's blood. Oh, night. In it this land will flood Tomorrow you will see The heads upon space From all my cries, O oh night I cannot breathe my family will be slaughtered 
the feeling. It's as if Zainab tells this night to stay a bit longer. She's counting the hours, yes. Uh, <laughs> my family will be slaughtered the feeling. After the Prophet's will, can you believe? Instead of love, his family will be left in grief. Oh, oh night, just like they crushed his chest. The chest of Rasulullah by crushing Fatima's chest. Oh, oh night, just like they crushed his chest. Oh, oh night, they will cut his neck. Oh, oh night. Just like they crushed his chest Oh, not They will cut his neck Tomorrow you will see The heads upon tree Look at the women on night and their state. What state are they in? Look at the women on night and their state. Layla hugging Akbar, he'll be cut with hate. Qasim and Ramla accepting the Grim's fate. Rabab holding Azhar, his calamity await. Oh, oh, night, tragedy, tomorrow. Oh, oh, night, an infant and arrow. This summarizes the tragedy of Karbala. How cruel can one get? Oh, oh, night, tragedy, tomorrow. Oh, oh, night, an infant and arrow. Yes, so believers, Zainab would bring the infant of Imam al Hussein. She would tell him, Oh, Abba Abdullah, his mother has no more milk to feed him. Ask these people, maybe they will give him some water. Imam al Hussein would bring this infant towards the people. He would tell them, It is me who you are fighting. The children have nothing to do with this. Give him some water. If you are scared that I will drink this water, then take him. Give him water, then bring him back to me. The people would split into two. Half of the army saying, Give him water. The children have nothing to do with this. The other half saying, Do not leave anyone from this. This household. Amar ibn Sa'd, may Allah withdraw his mercy with Rikat Haramala. May Allah withdraw his mercy from them both. He would tell him, Oh Haramala, make this discussion stop, make this argument stop. Haramala narrates, he said, I looked at the infant of Hussein. I had my three point arrow ready. Ajar 
تباركم الله اي سوي وين ذات allowed me to see his neck the wind would move his clothing I saw his neck I saw it like a white ball so I I get got my three point arrow ready and I shot it and I killed his infant cutting his veins Hajarakum Allah Imam Al Hussein would put his hand under the neck of his infant he would carry the blood in his hand then he would throw it to the skies Imam Al Baqir narrates the angels would come down the angels collected the blood of Al Radiyah they said by he said by Allah if a drip of this blood would fall back on the ground the earth would have collapsed with whoever was on it Ajarakum Allah but I say in what state he then took him back to the tents he would put him under his aba, under his cloak he would take him Sukaina would say oh father she didn't hear the cries of her of her brother she said to him oh father did you just give him some water and you brought back the rest he would he would reveal a radiyah from under his aba. She would see his, her brother slaughtered. Ajarakum Allah. Zainab would take him. His mother Abab would take him. They would cry and weep. But this is one time that Imam al Hussein would interact with Sukaina. This was not the last time. One more time he would interact with her. When he would give his farewells to the family, he would Realize that Sukaina is not with the women. He asked the Zainab, Where is Sukaina? She said to him, She is in her tent. He entered the tent. He saw Sukaina sitting, the sitting of those who are grieving, mourning, those who are sad. What kind of, how was she sitting? She was sitting with her head between her knees, crying and wailing. Imam al Hussein sat by her. He said to her, Oh, Sukaina, why are you crying? I will go, oh Sukaina, this is death that will part us. She tells, and you will come soon to meet me as well. She says to him, oh father, tell me, is this the last time you go? Will you come back again? Goal boy, goal, la tikhfi alayya. Aha, adi rahitak yo ba'ad jayya. In chayan raayah hai hiya. Ya boy, akhidni wiyak. An ba'adak magdar asbir. Oh father, if you are going, then take me with you. Ajarakum Allah. Allah, but yes, he had to send his final farewells. With this, and I will ask for your du'as, inshallah. Finishing these ten nights, inshallah, with this tear, the tears of him. Let's finish these nights with the tears of Sayyidah Zainab. Imam Al Hussein says his farewells, and then he says, <laughs> he says, he will bring my horse. And I am the son of Rasulullah. He will bring me my horse and I am the son of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He will bring me my horse and I am the son of Fatima al-Zahra. Zainab would bring the horse of Imam al Hussein and she would say to him, Oh Aba Abdullah, what sister would bring the horse of death to her brother? Hajarakum Allah, he would mount his horse and move towards the battlefield. Then he would hear a voice shouting, Brother Hussein. Come, come back, back, oh brother Hussein. He would come back, back say the Zainab called him. She said to him, come off your horse. He came off his horse. She said to him, open your chest, open. Let me smell your chest. Let me kiss your neck. She would smell his chest. She will kiss his neck. Then she would turn around to Medina shouting, oh mother Fatima, this was your will. When you see Hussein all alone, then smell his chest. The chest would chest.
The one that the horses will trample him and kiss his neck. Which neck? The neck that will be slaughtered. Ajarakum Allah. And to kiss his neck. But I say this was the first time she turned around to Medina. After a short while, she would turn around again. This time to her, to her grandfather, Rasulullah. When, when she saw the body of Hussein on the plains of Karbala, she would shout, Wa Muhammad, Ya Jaddi. يا جدي قوم شوف حسين مذبوح يا جدي من الطعن ما بقت بيروح يا جدي ما أت ما حد وقف دونه ولا نغار غمض له عيونه هي والله ولا نغار غمض الله يا عيون صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا أمير المؤمنين صلى الله عليك يا فاطمة الزحراء سيدة النساء العالمين صلى الله عليك يا حسن المجتبى السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب